What's up, guys? Welcome to the zoo. We have an amazing show for you today. Today, we're going to be joined by Edwin Alexis Gomez, who's the creator of the PBS short film Joyride, which premieres next week. We are going to have all that and more for you right here on the zoo. What's up, guys? Welcome to the zoo. I'm going to introduce our very sexy panel today. We have Brittany oh. and Bruno. How are you guys doing? What's Amazing. Up? Guys, so today we're going to be talking about family and working in entertainment. That is today's big deal. So how did your, you know, your families take it that you were going to enter a career in entertainment? Listen, they had it set out for, them, for me already because at the age of four, my mother had me in dance classes, she had me auditioning, and she pretty much made this, this path for me. And when I actually said as a young adult, I'm gonna pursue this, I'm really gonna do this, she was like, oh, but wait, oh, but maybe you should finish college, maybe you should go into something else, like something a little bit more professional, but I'm, I'm like, mom, are you kidding me? You're the reason why I wanna do this. <laughs> Right? It's like, it's ridiculous. But now I feel like fully supported and encouraged and it's, it's a really amazing experience while also feeling like they don't get any, anything at all. Right. So. My mom put me in dance classes too and then she oh. was shocked when I wanted to be a stripper. Oh, so I don't, well, I there mean, you go. Right? You should see him do the splits. It's, yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's extraordinary. I'm learning what how about to do you? <laughs> How are your I, splits? <laughs> my splits need work, but okay. um, I actually had an opposite experience of you. I, oh, wow. My dad is, you know, kind of business oriented. He wanted me to go to business school and kind of focus. Like, I did go to college. I followed, you know, they, they my parents raised me um, and supported me through everything. So I was like, the least I can do is, is you know, follow their trajectory for me. And right. so I went to school on the East Coast and I had a great time, but in classes, I was so much more interested in, in sociology and religion and kind of these ethereal, kind of more thought-provoking things than just right. accounting and taxes and all, you know, the stuff that maybe was designated for me um, by my parents. I think, and, and to your point, when your mom was worried, I think they worry about the financial security and, 100%. you know, how you're going to raise a family and they start thinking ahead, ahead, ahead because yeah. they're in that position. So. Once I decided, okay, I'm gonna do this, which was after college, um, my dad especially was very hesitant. And now, now that I've kind of made a, a, a life of it and I'm doing this and I have a clothing brand and I'm kind of explored you know, all my creativity in, in various ways, my dad's like, hey, why don't you, why don't you start acting more again? Oh. Like, and I'm like, what? I'm like, wait a minute. Because <laughs> they see Hold the results, on. that's yeah. why. Now yeah, you like, weren't saying oh, that when I got a C minus in accounting, you know what I mean? But, but um, shout out my accounting teacher, taught me nothing. Um, <laughs> but really, I'm, I'm so happy that I was able to get here myself and kind of prove like, hey, this is feasible, I can do it, I'm an adult, and, and made it happen, so. I had a very yeah. similar experience. My mom has never wanted me to get into entertainment. Um, and then now that you know, I've had some minimal successes, now she's like, how much are you getting paid for that? Yeah. You know what I mean? She thinks <laughs> she's like Dina question. Lohan. Yeah. She's like counting the checks as they're coming in. And then you know, I do stand up, so my mom came to see me do stand up in New York City last oh, year. And how she goes, that? are they gonna put a spotlight on me? I was like, why would they put a spotlight on you? Now she wants the attention. Right. Now I mean, she wants the recognition. Yes. Right, what's next? But like I, a couple of years ago, do you guys remember the MAGA bomber? who was like sending bombs in the mail to Oh, people. yes. Oh, I yes. was on the list of, Stop. of people. So I called my mom to tell her that no. I was the target of a bombing. And all she wanted to go, was it in a comedy club? Did you bomb? <laughs> Just I was like, no, mom, it's an act. People actually want to kill me. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's how important you are at this point. Right. People want to yeah. murder me. Success. Which is flattering. My agent got me that. Thank you. Um, yeah, every bomb that came. No, but it, it's so interesting as the tables turn, the more and more that you do it. Right. Totally. Yeah, they, it's really just like the proof in the pudding. Like, hey, are you getting results? Are you making money? Are you independent? You know? And I, I see that, though, and I feel that, and I, I'm not a mother. I'm not close to being a mother. Not anytime soon. <laughs> don't get it twisted, but people. Don't get it twisted, okay? Because <laughs> I need to have my plan before a man, okay? Ooh, ooh. Right. Well, do you them. think that you would be supportive of your children if they wanted to go into entertainment? 100%. I'd be supportive in anything they'd want to pursue because if I believe in them, then they'll believe in themselves and then they'll manifest and then they'll, they'll plan. They'll, they'll do everything they need to do because I believe in them so much. Suppose they're not very good. <laughs> um, I think you can get better at anything. 
It's and true. I think if it makes you happy, then I think that's what's most important and you're gonna put in the work. Because let's be real, this entertainment industry isn't all about skill. It's not all about talent. There's many different lanes and, and industries within the industry. Yep. So hard work beats talent when talent's not working hard enough. I always you know say what I'm that. Saying? But but to, and again to your point, the belief is so important. Like <laughs> I was just talking. Uh, I was actually watching an interview, and then I, I discussed this with a friend. But there's there's movies that you see right that mm -hmm. are like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and you're right. like, how did this Attack of the Killer Tomatoes movie get made? Like it's belief. Somebody just believed it. in it from start to finish. They hired the producer. They hired the director. They found the actors. But probably with no money, they put this together, and yep. now this movie is on Netflix or Hulu, and and it's because one person, maybe more, but but sometimes just one person had a hundred percent belief in themselves to to take it to that level. The right person yeah. fertilized those tomatoes. There you go. Took it yeah. To where it has to be. Yes. No, I feel like I'd be supportive of my child, but if my child, you know, has no rhythm. I don't know if I get, once we each age <laughs> well, 10, I'm gonna be a rockette, I'm not so sure. You know, and I feel like in some ways I'd wanna protect my child if they're not very good, I'd rather them hear it from me. Well, I think my child's already gonna be in therapy, and I <laughs> one thing, yet. One thing, one thing on protection though. This, this is the problem with protection. You could, you could only say or do so much to protect your child and to you know, um, help them prevent making mistakes, but they have to learn. They have to learn that even if they don't make it right, let's say they audition for the Rockettes. It's better that the Rockettes say that they can't be in the Rockettes than you, because if you're that person, they'll resent you. But suppose my kid's hungry on the streets and they have nowhere to eat. <laughs> All I'm, these well, scenarios. Well, that okay. reflects on you, bro. You better <laughs> feed your kids, right? <laughs> You make enough money so they don't have to do that. Who are these imaginary kids who aren't getting fed, all right? You're going to be a famous, very famous comedian by then, so you, you know, you better be feeding them their greens. I'm already, like, picturing my kid working at Rite Aid, which is not a good start. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Zoo here on LATV. Things are just heating up here. Now, I want everyone to focus Scottish. their attention on Miss Brittany, who's oh a God. new host. Welcome oh. aboard. Oh. Yes, she's on the couch. Let's go. I'm she's so already excited. dancing. How does it feel so far? Are you scared? Oh, Happy? my God. When I tell you, I was very, very nervous. Everything was sweaty. I was like, huh, like, what am I going to do? But you know what? I actually got really comfortable in the dressing room when I met him. Oh. And I was like, you know what? The format of this show feels so comfortable and vibrant and fun that like, you know what? Make mistakes, because mistakes are the best. Right. And that's what makes this show. Boom. I won't take that personally because I met you 10 minutes before. <laughs> but, <laughs> so tell us, tell us a little bit more about your passions. Who is Brittany? Oh my God, that's such a loaded question. But um, Brittany is, is, is a happy person. Brittany is someone who wants to inspire people to aspire to happiness. Um, I am, in love with acting, I love painting. Like that has been the best way to relieve my stress. It's incredible. Um, I'm now writing, so I actually am writing uh, um, another short film. I have one to film, and I have uh, one that's already been out. Um, it's a horror film, and that is like a. Uh, passion, dream role, breakout role, like I wanna be the crazy person yeah. in the movie, okay? Scaring your children, your children, yes. Oh, you wanna uh -oh. be the villain? I want to be the villain. Do you ever see any Latinas being the villain in a horror film? No, we're, we're, we're these pretty things that, oh, cry and run away, and it's like, no, I want to bother you and kill you, you know? That's awesome. Be that person. I get that enough in relationships, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be honored if you killed me. But yes, honestly, yes. I'd be honored. You have a good energy. Right? Stab me right here on as the couch. As long as it's on the screen. It's yeah. Jersey. <laughs> the screen. Just the screen. Yes. So, where are you from originally? So, I am from New Jersey, and um, I'm Puerto Rican. And I am super prideful about that, okay? Because we wave our flags everywhere high and. Yes. High, 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 yes. Um, so that is a huge part of me. Like my culture is everything. Like I always want to put people on to tostones, surullos, you know, mm. mofongo. You already know, mofonguito, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. So, and salsa, yes, we, we love all of that. So um, that's a huge part of who I am. And I eventually want to make a documentary about Puerto Rico. I love it. <sighs> yes, that's you like. You a lot, you're like. I know. Oh, but yeah, that's like. 
a huge like goal. Like that's gonna take years. So see me in a decade, and I'll have a documentary. So out. after you kill people on film, after then I we're kill gonna people get to the documentary. And <laughs> scare <laughs> the children. We kill people, then we save people. Exactly. Yes. Then in that order only. Yes. Exactly. I, I, I'm no other sense. way to do it. That's right. You know what I mean? That's so, right. <laughs> listen, I'm chasing happiness, okay? You're doing it, and we're here for you with the ride. You're doing yes. it right. Now, there's a special project you're involved with. Or there's um, something you wanted to bring to our attention? Yes, 100%. So um, I wanted to bring attention to uh, Thalia, a beautiful baby girl, um, three years old, who was brutally murdered on January 19th by her caretaker, um, Lorraine Washington. Um, she is free walking the streets of downtown LA. Um, she was ar arrested, interrogated but unfortunately released. She does suffer from mental illness and we are demanding justice for Thalia. And more importantly, we are demanding that um, Lorraine Washington P be um, put in a facility to get treatment so that she's not doing this to other people and so that she's not a danger. Um, we want to heal, we wanna operate out of love and um, it's, it's very important to bring awareness to this specifically because this not only represents Lorraine Washington as a person, you know, this is how a system has failed a three-year-old black child who is homeless. And it's like, if, you, if, the, if the government, if the system can't protect a child, who else are they gonna protect, honestly? And so um, this has no media coverage. And I actually just found out about this today. And it's How like- How did you find out about it? Um, so there is a woman, her name is Lariah. Um, she is the, she's an exquisite person, but um, she has a, a nonprofit called Lunch on Me. And she feeds the homeless um, in Hawaii, in New York, in Los Angeles. Um, she has a bodega that sustains her nonprofit. So um, actually, Thalia was known as the bodega baby. So she is a very important person, and her life, even her life, is important. You know, justice for her is important. Um, justice for everyone is important. So yeah. Why do you think the media hasn't covered this story? That's a great question. Um, I think the media hasn't covered this story because it's it's small. It's small in the sense of homeless people are seen as small. Homeless people are seen as, you know, off to the side and um, not as important. And um, I think another reason is because the system failed her. The police released the person that murdered a three-year-old child. So why would they want to cover that, you know? Why would they want to bring that to attention? Why would they want to, especially with everything happening with Black Lives Matter, why would they want to just add it? You know, it's, it doesn't look good. <laughs> I mean, simply, it just doesn't look good, so. Yeah, I think the, yeah. the media is, it's this weird thing where we reward like these clickbait things, you know, like what's yes. gonna get the most views and how can we sensationalize this to make it the most ridiculous story possible and something like this that's so tragic and important, nobody wants to hear because it's sad. And, yeah. and it's like, but we have to face that too, you know, it's not just about, you know, what's the most graphic story we can tell. Right. It's about these things that are happening in our community, right in front of our eyes, that are then getting hidden because we're too scared to address homelessness. We're too scared to address mental illness. That's what we're it is, We're too scared. Yeah. So That fear. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. Yeah. Um, and I blame the algorithm. Because yeah. I feel like the things that yeah. we see, I'd like to see more real news stories and less of Kim Kardashian's butt. Yeah. And, and, but another thing. <laughs> okay. There's, I, there's not even an article <laughs> written about her. So yep. it's, you know, it's, it's And let ridiculous. me tell you, there's too many articles about Kim's butt. So yeah. we need Way to pay, many. we need to, you know, prioritize the news that we're getting. So Absolutely. thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. Welcome aboard on thank the zoo. You. Welcome back to the zoo, everybody. So we're going to go into a little bit Manny Perez on uh, Big Dog. But before we dive into that, you know, it's a show about cops, which is very controversial right now at a time where we're like defunding the police and not a right. lot of people feel great about the cops. Yes. So what do you guys think about the future of shows about the police? Oh, oh my God. Where is the future of these cop shows? Like it feels it feels like they're they're going to they're going to go two ways. Right. 
they're going to start making more storylines that make you empathize more with the cops, or it's going to be a strategy to demonize the cops. Um, I think I think it's really dependent on what the producers want to tell, what story they want to portray. Um, I don't think it's going to be the truth, and I don't think it's going to be ac accurate. So um, it's this weird dichotomy, and we're, we're seeing that now. You know, where everyone's trying to pretend like, oh, it's all good. There's only a few bad apples, and you know, we're, we're okay. Like they protect us, but. The reality is they have too many responsibilities, they don't have enough training, it takes twice as long to become a barber than it does to yeah. become a police officer. And so Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which we just did an article on LATV.com, if you guys want to tune into that, um, about the writers of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is similar to Reno 911. It's a funny take on a cop show with these mm -hmm. kind of affable, charismatic police officer characters. And it's like, is that appropriate right now? Right. When, when there are yeah. cops out there killing people of color. That's what I mean. We're going to be we're going to be seeing a lot of different stories and we're going to just have to pick it out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to find the truth yourself. It's exactly. a lot of work everybody. So now we're going to cut to Humberto's interview with Manny Perez of Big Dog. Don't go anywhere. The NYPD's elite organized crime intelligence division should be all over this and it's not. Something is rancid in OCID. This is happening everywhere. Not just New York. It was really running this country. It doesn't matter. It matters to me. People are dying. These people have families. The bad things don't hide in the shadows anymore. It's all out in the open. Big dogs. Talk to me about it, man. It looks really cool. It's like it's like a throwback to like the the really gritty, uh, you know, a cop and robber, you know, a murder mystery kind of shows. Very New York. Yeah, it's very New York. Well, you know what's funny? You know, we shot this about 20 months ago. And we shot, this, this, this is based on these books uh, by Adam Dunn, uh, okay. where basically society is chaos. Um, uh, the economy is broken down. Banks are bankrupt. Then you have this undercover cop named Sixto Santiago, Dominican from Washington Heights. That's the part I play, uh, who's trying to find the truth behind all this chaos. Right. Now, mind you, this was shot 20 months ago, which is a year and a half ago cut to present day, and present day is exactly what's happening in those shows, which is bizarre and crazy for them. I'm like, this is like a different world. But I was watching some of the trailers and, and, I, and I can see that, wow, some of the, like the murders are really grisly, like you guys really take it kind of like, you know, to, to a really, uh, a spot that I haven't seen a lot of shows do in a while, you know? So what was the conversation like what, what, when, when you guys were making the show where people were like, ah, maybe we should hold back, or, or, or you guys like, you know, let's just go for it. Yeah, no, the, the, the producers wanted to make it real as it, as it gets. They wanted to go back to that, you know, the 70s movies, you know, like reality, Sidney Lumet type of films. When we were shooting, we were afraid of the scenes that we were shooting because it was so real to what happens, you know. Um, but I love that. As an actor, I love that. So I always try to push the envelope, you know, to the next level. Uh, Manny, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, I, I, see, I hear the New York accent. So yeah. you're, you're from the New York area. Tell me a little bit about your background for our viewers. Well, I'm Dominican, Dominican Republic, born and raised there. Came here when I was 10 years old. Uh, grew up uh, acting uh, theater, a lot of theater off, off Broadway. Then I went into major in uh, acting at Marymount Manhattan College. And um, so I've been doing, you know, doing this theater, independent films, uh, a lot of episodic work. Um, so yeah, that's that's my background. So how did you get into something like theater? You know, uh, uh, when you got this tough guy accent like you got. Well, oh, dude, that's funny you said that. You know, I always play a bad guy. I always play <laughs> the thug because of my look. I mean, I look like a bad. <laughs> but that's a good thing. That's a good thing sometimes. I look like a bad dude, but I always try to find the heart in these in these in these guys and these characters, just to make them human. Because. You know, the baddest, baddest dude is still a human guy, has a heart. So I try to grab, aim for the heart in my in my acting. So and since I was a little kid, I come from a family of, of 11 kids. I was the performer, I was the clown in the family. So I wanted to pursue it and continue this. And that's how I got into acting, is because I love to escape from my everyday life and explore this world of acting, you know? So uh, tell me, how did this show come together? Was, was Did they find the books and then they, they wanted to make a show on that and, 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 and then they started uh, uh, shopping it around? How, how did the show develop? Well, the, the writer of the books, his name is Adam Dunn, he has these great books, four books. So he shopped it around and then uh, I guess he found this company to produce it. So they produced it and then they uh, 
were, were looking for actors. They they knew my work. They were looking for a Dominican actor, and me being Dominican, they they were aware of my of my work, and they uh, called me up and said, "Hey, you want to be part of this?" And I'm like, "Well, sure. Let me read the scripts." And I read the first script, and I was like, "Wow, I'm in love with this character." First of all, it's rare. It's right. really rare to find uh, Latino roles where you have the lead, especially yeah. if you're Dominican. I mean, they don't. Dominican don't exist in white America. I don't know what Dominican is. Dominican to them is Sammy Sosa, and that's it. Yeah. So, so it's um, so to me, it's like a, it, it, it was a great opportunity to be part of this amazing ensemble. You know, we have also uh, in it uh, Michael Richardson, which is a uh, Liam uh, Nielsen's son. Um, Michael Rabe, uh, Brett Cullen is also in it, an amazing actor. So it's a pretty great cast, you know. Who are the bad guys in this show? Everyone in the show is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. um, they also have this whole European side to it. Uh, these uh, European uh, uh, bad dudes that come through, Russians, uh, Lebanese. Uh, it's a whole mix of what, you know, makes a gritty, dirty show. Mm -hmm. And the one that you think the person that you think is the good guy is actually the bad, one of the bad guys. So it's mm -hmm. great. I mean, it keeps you guessing throughout the whole uh, season, you know? Manny, thank you for joining us. Perfect. And uh, looking forward to seeing the whole series, man. The trailer's awesome, and it's really a pleasure speaking to you, man. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Take it easy, Manny. Welcome back to The Zoo, guys. So if you love Humberto, you're in luck, because he's doing a great interview with the podcasters from Planeta Hey. I'm here with Valentina Stackle and Crystal Mojica, the creators of Planeta G. Um, it's going to be a cool new environmental series. It's associated with Greenpeace, am I right? Yes. It is. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about the series. So Planeta G is a Latinx series that focuses on the environmental movement and our place in it. Valentina and I met about a year ago when we both started at Greenpeace, and we immediately had this connection with each other because of our Latinidad and that really brought us together. But we also saw this gap of representation within Greenpeace. Um, we definitely saw there was a gap of um, just getting closer to Latinx people and approaching them in a way um, that is more relatable. I mean, Latinx people have always been extremely mindful of the environment. I mean, my mom is Colombian and like back in Colombia, we were always like taught like take care of the planet, like water the plants, compost, like recycle, you keep like the jar of like, you know, sewing supplies, et cetera. The list goes on and on. And so we knew that um, our community was always deeply tied to the environmental movement in one way or another. Uh, and we wanted to give them the proper representation. And that's why we started this project. The other thing too, is that we wanted to be fun. A lot of times activism um, can seem like a bit of a drag. It's a bit, it's a lot, you know, but we, we also want to show that there's joy and beauty and community and family in the work that we do. And that's why we want to bring in um, our friends, our, our families, our moms, you know, and all these people to create like a joyous uh, movement around environmentalism and, and our like to need that too. How, how do you guys collaborate? What's that like? <laughs> that's a good question. I think everyone is still figuring it out as we're doing it because we just started this show, but really, because we sit next to each other at work, we, when we used to be at the office, we would have lunch together. Like we are super kind of aligned and agree on like most editorial decisions anyway. So we do a lot of talking, a lot of chatting and sort of decide like who would it be cool to talk to. Um, and it feels very organic and very natural. I don't know if you agree, Crystal. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we drink mate together at the office. That's like the first thing. I, she knows I mean business when I come into the office with my mate in hand and from the moment that we met each other it was just like this again this instant connection that we had and because we share a very similar background um, like being mixed and it's it was just like a really beautiful um, connection and I'm, I'm glad that Valentina and I have each other in this in this new job. Yeah, and I think also the cool thing is that we're super open to bringing in all kinds of voices. And so we've really reached out into our networks, both at Greenpeace and beyond to just say like, hey, this is our first episode. What do you think? Like, who do you want to see on the show? And we're also ask our audience, you know, every, you know, by, by the end of the episode, we'll say like, 
who do you want to see on the show? Who do you want us to talk to? Because I think um, we want to show how broad the movement is. And, you know, we have our own network, but there's so many more voices out there that we want to include. Uh, um, describe the, you, uh, you, 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 you hit on it being fun. And I think that's very important. You know, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's easier to get to a bigger group of people if, if you're fun about it, but describe the, the nature of the show. What are the kind of things that you're specifically talking about maybe on, on some of the first episodes? Yeah, I mean, the important thing to remember is that the environmental movement and climate change, it's not just a very narrow set of things, right? Like sometimes we think about environmentalism and we think pollution or air quality or water, but that's not really the end of it. Climate and environmental you know, policy and environmental movement work encompasses so many things, including migration and financial sector and policies and politics and um, all kinds of things. So I think that's the, the first thing that I want to make sure we know is that like it could be anything um, that relates, that a lot of things relate to the climate movement and to environmental movement. So the first episode, um, we basically just set the scene. We talk about what is um, Latinx, what is Latine, how can we be inclusive in our language, because that's very important to us. And then as we go on, we, we bring on guests. So the first episode, we don't have a guest, but then second, third, et cetera, we will have guests. Um, if you want to talk about our guest, Crystal, that'd be cool. Yeah, sure. Um, for our next episode, um, we're really excited. We've got a prominent climate youth activist. She is Colombian American. Uh, she's Jamie Margolin. Um, I don't know if you've heard, she recently authored a new book. It's called Youth to Power, um, Your Voice and How to Use It. And so she's 18 years old. And that's also another really great thing that we want to highlight the diversity um, of the movement, that it's not just people who are older, or it's not just young people. It's like a mix of people from all over the place. And we're also wanting to highlight folks who are outside of the US as well. Greenpeace has over um, has offices in over 50 countries. And we want to highlight what the Latin American experience is outside of the US as well. Um, so we recently spoke to one of our um, climate campaigners who's based in Argentina. And that's going to be another episode as well. Um, but we're really open to just collaborating with Latinx folks who might not be given that mic. And we also incorporate you know talking to our mothers and families and and i think the episodes will vary um but we definitely want to make sure that we're touching on all the issues that matter to us most and we're uplifting our voices at the end of the day how did the two of you um become associated with greenpeace or become a part of greenpeace yeah we both work for greenpeace we're both on the comms team um we came from sort of a little bit different backgrounds. Crystal was just coming back from Peace Corps and I was working at another NGO doing human rights and environmental justice work. And we both ended up at Greenpeace basically within a month um, of each other. And yeah, so we were both on the comms team. Um, yeah, working on different campaigns, but also collaborating on this. Awesome. And Planeta Hey, I said it wrong in the beginning of the, uh, of the podcast. I said Planeta G, so well, explain Planeta Hey. Planeta G, I think the idea stemmed from uh, Greenpeace and tying it back to the green movement um, and tying it to also our planet and the planeta that we have and we foster together as a, a Latinx community um, and how we can get people to come over to our side, <laughs> our neck of the woods and like get excited and learn about our culture and learn about how we relate to one another and how we protect our planeta. We still have time to go back. Oh, this is basically viejita purgatorio. We don't have much time left with her. Okay, but breaking grandma out and driving across state lines isn't necessarily mm -hmm. legal. Yeah, well, neither was gay marriage. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the zoo. We have a very special guest with us today, Edwin Alexis Gomez, director and writer of short film Joyride, which is going to premiere next week in PBS's short film festival. <gasps> yes! I Exciting! I know. I'm super excited, too. Like, you guys have no idea. I think there's <laughs> going to be a great lineup of films as well. So tell us about Joyride. Yeah, so Joyride is basically about two teenage Latina sisters that break their grandmother out of her senior living facility for a joyride to the Grand Canyon. We and so that. as the story progresses, we kind of figure out why the Grand Canyon and why they're going on this journey. So it was a lot of 
fun to write and to direct, so. I have to tell you, when I saw the film, the first thing that I did was I had to call my grandma. Oh, because really? it's, I feel like in these times where we're consumed with so much sad news, it was such a feel-good story, and it's about family, and it's about perseverance, and it's really, she was a survivor. Yeah. No, definitely. And I love that you called your grandmother, because I feel like that's exactly what it was for. It was for all of us who have our abuelita, like at home, um, really honor the matriarchs of the family. Yep. Which really the matriarchs are always the glue. Powerful. You know? Yeah. And and I think it was just this idea of what we inherit from like our our bloodline, from our lineage. So it was something that I feel was necessary. Mm -hmm. And I love that, like, you know, in this time of quarantine and stuff, it's like this road trip movie when we can't really take road trips in the way we right. used to. Um, and then you're going to a national park. I don't wanna give away too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but you know, it's one of those things where it meant so much to be able to capture that. We filmed last summer, so it was way before any and anybody saw what was gonna happen right. this year, right? So I'd like to touch a little bit on the theme of, of the movie. I, I know yeah. you don't wanna give it away, but yeah. um, you know, it does touch on domestic abuse. And what I think yes. is so powerful is that it shows that domestic abuse doesn't discriminate by race. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think, so, so one thing to note mm -hmm. is I was a domestic violence advocate for probably seven to eight years. I worked the graveyard shift at a domestic violence shelter. And so for me, meeting all these survivors, like literally men, uh, women, and children who were victims and yeah. they were on their road to become survivors, like it, it's also kind of a love letter to them. It's also a love That's letter for, for anybody who's going through yeah. something very serious like Juana kind of lived. And Juan is kind of intervening in the lives of her, her granddaughters and saying, please mm -hmm. don't allow anybody to treat you this way. Don't allow anybody to um, basically just make you feel that you're anything but valuable and wonderful mm -hmm. and important. And the message spans generations because mm -hmm. it affected their grandmother. It can very well much affect the granddaughters too. Exactly. And, and I think that's the thing, right? I feel like all of this is intergenerational. Right, like we grow up yep. seeing things and growing up in a home with domestic violence doesn't mean you're gonna become a victim or you're gonna become an abuser, but it does leave scars, it does leave things that we must heal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that regardless of race, ethnicity or sexuality, we never talk about. Like we never talk about these things mm -hmm. with our families. We never, we never learn this in school. We never learn how we should be treated, how, right. how love should feel or be. Right. You know, so it was really important to kind of uh, showcase that in this film, but also to showcase this um, as Latin Americans, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like regardless of it's, if it's your father, your mother, your grandfather, your grandmother, we come from a similar history, a history mm -hmm. that has a lot of violence, even yep. if it's not in the home, it's literally governmental, right? Yep. It's a civil war. Yeah. So I think for me, all of those scars, we we need to kind of speak about in order to genuinely heal and move forward from. We need to confront them. Exactly. We need to forgive those people. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and that's the thing. There's this moment where, in a way, the action Juana takes um, alleviates everything right. from even, even her husband. Yeah. You know? She concealed it for so long. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and there's so many layers. And so I do have a feature version of it that goes really in depth. Obviously, yes. we have one whole generation, right, that's missing, which is the sister's mom, uh, Juana's daughter. And I'm very interested in her. Yeah. Because she seems like a force. She seems like a disruptor. Oh, no, totally. <laughs> She gave those girls the confidence to break their grandma out of the, out of the home. <laughs> and you know they didn't want to get in Wait, trouble. Right. You know you what know. I love, though? I love the fact that the grant, like, Juana was, like, the star of the senior citizen <laughs> yeah. home. Like, she was, like, all yes. the winning bingo. All the ladies exactly. around her bingo. Yes. They were counting She's her like, chips. Oh. Okay, yes. let me just, exactly. I love that. She had the I floor, love... she was like, these are my grandkids and I'm leaving, <laughs> yes. which exactly. I loved. Now, I, I want to, you know, I think what's so powerful about this film, and it's so timely, because we're in a time where people are in quarantine with their, mm -hmm. with their partners and we're seeing the yes. domestic abuse numbers rise. Exactly. Which is really, you know, so what do you want people to take away from this film? <sighs> you know, what it is, is honestly, we, just need to remember how valuable our lives are. Yep. Um, and I say that 
it's so multi-layered right now when I say that. I mean, it's as simple as like, and I know that it's become a political thing, but it's as simple as wearing a mask, right? It's as simple as like deciding that enough is enough. And I think sometimes we hold on to the hope that someone will change or we're afraid because we listen to the things that we're being told, like no one's gonna love us, you know, no yeah. one's gonna uh, be interested in us. So we, we really do believe this narrative that sometimes our partners create for us. And so I think it's really critical for us to engage in these dialogues because oftentimes, and especially now, we are really interrupting a lot of the social um, relationships we have. We're not seeing friends, we're not seeing family. And sometimes those things, those things are, like the thing is someone who's abusive is never the person who you're like, oh, that's an abuser. It's always someone charming. Yep. Yep. It's always someone who oh, And then the mask never comes know. off. Exactly. exactly. And then you're just like, oh my God, like what, what's happening? And I think that that's, that's something that we all must look at. And so if I could give any advice, if I could say anything mm -hmm. for anybody who maybe watches the film and feels that they're in a similar situation that Juana describes, yeah. I would say to really safety plan and think about the things that you know, you can do to protect yourself. Right. Uh, calling the National Domestic Violence Hotline, seeing what local yeah. domestic violence shelters around, you know, but making sure that you're doing it safely. And it's so important. I love yeah. it. Thank you. Hey everyone, we are back on the zoo with Edwin Alexis Gomez. Woo! So, I know that you are a Nicaraguan. Mm -hmm. And I would love to know more about your culture, mm -hmm. how it's inspired your work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about your culture, so yeah. please enlighten me. Okay, <laughs> I will enlighten you, girl. <laughs> For all the Nicaragüenses out there, too. Yes. So uh, there's this saying, Nicaragüense por gracias de Dios, which means Nicaraguan by the grace of God. So okay. you can imagine how, how extra how, yeah. <laughs> those five million people are. But uh, I've always lived, I like was born and have grown up in Los Angeles. Mm, okay. So like I'm one of those Angelino unicorns, yes. you know, that we've just like been here. Um, <laughs> but it's been really great. So I basically had an art background. I started writing a lot of poetry as I was young. And then I was doing some documentaries and I'm like, well, what marries all these things? And I just landed on film. And so the natural progression was, you know, creating narrative film. And uh, this is my third short film. I love that. Um, it's, it was actually done with Latino Public Broadcasting. Mm. I got a funding grant. They're amazing. I just want to shout them out because yes, please do. The, this film exists because of them. And also because of my producing partners, Angela Pedraza and Evelyn Martinez. You know, they're amazing, uh, yeah. badass Latina producers, yes. you know, uh, writers and directors themselves. Just like all three of us are from different backgrounds ourselves, like Evelyn's Mexican-American, Angela is a Colombian-American, and then I'm Nicaraguan-American. So we all have our own flavor. Point. We all have our own dialects we write in, you know, so we, we make sure to honor just our histories, yeah. you know? Tell our stories. Exactly, all, the I'm whole gamut all of that. them, Yeah. you know? How does Joyride differ from some of your earlier films? Um, so it's kind of, it's funny, it's kind of in the family of the films, but I think it's the first film I've done that centers a f like just a whole female cast. My other two films, um, Quédate Callado, is a one minute short and ended up winning a Grand Jury Award at Outfest Fusion. Thank you, and it was great. It was with Georgie Goico and Eddie Anguiano. Um, there, there's this moment where two friends realize that they're in love with each other after many, many years. The second film I did, which also premiered at actually Outfest, Los Angeles, was called La Sad Boy. And it was about this Puerto Rican um, actor kind of going through the motions of being in Los Angeles and being an actor wow. and going out for roles of, you know, the cholo, the drug dealer. Um, but then also on his birthday, deciding like who he wants to be in the world, right? So that was kind of like the self versus, you know, society or what's expected of us. And then this film, Joyride, really leaned into this idea of what do we emotionally inherit, yeah. right? What do we... Um, the what can, yes, what, what are the traumas, right? And one mm -hmm. of the big things for me with this, with this film that's different is I'm playing with the idea that we can transfer healing up, right? Because oh, okay. we, we always talk about right. how traumas 
Um, brings you down. Exactly. And it's, or yes. it's, it's passed down through the DNA. Right. So in my mind, I'm like, if we get it right here, mm -hmm. we're actually healing all those people right. who have even passed. Because you're impacting the future. Exactly. And you're raising awareness so what history doesn't repeat itself. Exactly. exactly. And that's so critical, I think, for all of us. E even in this moment, you know, just yeah. politically and everything happening in our country, you know, it's so critical for us to really interrogate and investigate those things that really are holding us back. Yeah. And I think that for me, film is such a beautiful medium in illustrating that for everyone, right? Because I was working one-on-one -on -one with people at the shelter, mm -hmm. but in my mind, I was like, well, how can I reach more people? And so film was kind of the way that I decided to do that. How can you be 10,000 people? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, lo I love that. I mean, I think that's 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 a great way to use your life is to be more than one person mm -hmm. and i see that you're doing that so that's very beautiful yeah. um i have a quick question for you yeah. too though who um who inspires you in the industry Ooh. or just in your life someone okay. close to you yeah i mean okay so like <laughs> there's if, a if lot we're, i know there's a lot but like if i were to say like who inspires me who am i like i watch their stuff and i'm like oh my god it's always pedro almodovar and i think it's because his work is very novella, okay, but is also really just complex when it comes to the relationships. But honestly, like my producing partners inspire me. Yeah, my partner Ricardo Licea, who's a musician, really inspires me. Oh. There's like this dialogue between, you know, music and film. Mm -hmm. Like film being so musical in itself as a medium, but then music itself elevating it. And that's the other thing about the film yes. is the soundtrack really does kind of marry all yeah. of these different levels. Uh, the writing the, and the actors to um, Blanca Araceli, Stacey Patino, uh, Jenny Trevino. I think they bring, you know, Juana and Karina and Marina to life in a way that like, I couldn't have asked for a better cast. Yeah, they did a phenomenal yeah. job. Yeah. They did, they yeah. did. I, your, your films encapsulate such important messages. What else do you want to tackle next? What do you think your next film will be about? Ooh, okay, so my next film, so I'm actually working on a feature version of Joyride, so, so that's gonna be the thing that I'm tackling. I'm also currently working on this project with the writing partner, Andrew Rosendorf, that's kind of a period piece that's <gasps> dealing with a, a lot of layers in itself. I that can't go exciting. into it too much. But, um, but those are kind of on the docket. I also do have a play that I'm adapting into a short film called Flower of Anger, uh, which is also dealing with this intergenerational I love aspect. You're on a roll. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff on the docket, um, but I'm excited because I'm, I just love exploring these familial relationships and how complex and intricate they are. Yes. Uh, and what, what kind of a, like I, I'm one of that believes that like what plays on the stage doesn't play in your life. Right. So in mm. my mind, I'm like, what can we kind of go through and look at and, and have people experience through film where uh, they don't have to live it themselves. Right. Wow. Or if you've lived it, you feel seen. Yeah. Right? And, and representation matters. Your stories matter. Um, what advice do you have for young filmmakers? Oh, <laughs> you know, that's a beautiful question. So oh, thank good. you for asking of it. Of course. I would say for me, honestly, it's just right. Oh. Just write, keep writing. It's a muscle. Don't, yeah, don't muscle. listen. Don't listen to the rejections. Don't listen to a program you applied to that you didn't get into. Like you have to persist because yeah. you're only gonna keep getting better. And the one thing that I didn't realize was like you're constantly rewriting even in the edit room. Mm -hmm. So just know that it, you just have to fall in love with the process. I love it. Thank you so much yes. for sharing your light with us and, and your films inspire people, which is so important. And thank you for amplifying these voices through your art. Thank, thank you, you so much yeah. to Edwin Alexis Gomez for being yes. here today. Thank Joy you, Ride too. premieres in PBS's short film festival on Monday. Voting opens on Monday as well. Thank you, Brittany, for being here. And thank you to all of you. You are watching the zoo on LATV. We'll see you soon.